Welcome to the joint meeting of the American Society for Microbiology and the International Society of Chemotherapy here in San Diego as we together join the 55th Interscience Conference on Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy and the International Congress of Chemotherapy here at ICC ICAC. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. This is a meeting whose focus is on antibiotic resistance, antibiotic development, and antibiotic stewardship. This meeting offers the attendees an unparalleled opportunity to collaborate with the cutting edge that is going on in this, these particular disciplines. Together, you and I will be able to ask questions of the speakers at this meeting, and the program committee has selected just but a few for us to interact with here at ASM Live. I'm Michael Schmidt from ASM's This Week in Microbiology, and it's my honor to uh, discuss some of the science here, and we're going to welcome today uh, Vitas Coralius from the Mayo uh, Medical School and Dr. Robin Patel, also of the Mayo Medical School from beautiful Rochester, Minnesota. Um, Vitas is going to present a poster, or you have presented a poster? A presentation. A presentation. Oh, you got one of the oral sessions. I did. Even better, on a really interesting topic about a, a Bordetella peripatussis outbreak that was in Minnesota in 2014. So Vitas, why don't you share with us the principal question that your study asked and how you went about and did it? Um, so I guess the principal question, we didn't set out initially with a question more than um, we noticed that there was a spike in the levels of Bordetella peripertussis um, within the Mayo Clinic Rochester patients during surveillance of the PCR assays. And so seeing that, we wanted to take, a, a, I guess, a better look at what was actually occurring with that increase in Bordetella peripertussis in 2014. Um, so we set out to examine um, the patients that had a positive PCR test for Bordetella peripertussis. So what is Bordetella peripertussis and how does it differ from its relative Bordetella pertussis that I learned once upon a time as a entry microbiologist as good old whooping cough? So Bordetella peripertussis is a cousin, if you will, um, of Bordetella pertussis. And Bordetella pertussis, etiologically, uh, was thought to be the cause of Bordetella, or uh, pertussis or whooping cough, the clinical syndrome. Um, but uh, Bordetella peripertussis used to be thought to have a lesser um, effect, but it's been shown a, quite a bit in studies recently that Bordetella peripertussis is capable of causing the same kind of clinical syndrome as Bordetella pertussis. So what is, what is the syndrome? If I'm, I'm a new parent and I, I'm worrying about my poor kids who seem to have this cough that won't go away, is that something I should be concerned with? You know, what, what sort of things do I need to look at as a, as a young parent? So Dr. Patel might be able to help me out with this, but uh, Bordetella pertussis or whooping cough um, will typically have a child with a, a prolonged cough that uh, it's been nicknamed the 100 day cough. So it'll be a cough that won't go away. Um, in infants, it can be uh, rather intense. Um, it's been cited that uh, children can even break their ribs from coughing so hard. Um, but one of the interesting things is that uh, there's this post tuss of vomiting. So they cough so hard that they kind of gag and are kind of vomiting while they're coughing. Um, and so that's always very alarming to the, the parents when, when that's occurring with their child. So, a as a, a new medical student, did you go out on uh, YouTube and look at what whooping cough presented like the first time to, to discover what you were getting yourself into? Yeah, and we, uh, we even got little uh, clips of what whooping cough looked like during our microbiology class in the first year, but uh, there's this typical, <gasps> if you will, this whoop that occurs you as they're gasping from the air because they're coughing for such a long period of time that they're not able to gather enough of a breath, so when they can, there's this, I guess, hallmark whoop or <gasps> inhaling that occurs. So, Yeah, it's, it's, it's really pretty remarkable when you experience it the first time when you, when you actually see it. So typically, how do we prevent whooping cough in, in today's world? So 
uh, we have a vaccine, um, a pertussis vaccine, and uh, that's recommended by the CDC. And, uh, and generally, um, most of the developed world has a vaccination campaign in place. Um, and that is protective against Bordetella pertussis. So that sort of takes us to your, to your study because you saw this uptick in patients presenting in the clinic that were presenting what would appear to have been uh, whooping cough-like symptoms and then you effectively diagnosed that they were actually having parapertussis. So what was your thinking in, in going about conducting this study? I'm, I'm not quite understanding. So, so how did you get the genesis of the idea to, to begin looking for peripatosis? So maybe I'll jump in for a minute okay. here. Yeah. So um, he was in my microbiology class as a first year student and came to me and said, I'm, I'm looking for a project. Ooh. Yeah, and I'm always excited to have people who want to work on projects, and, and we always have a lot of ideas for projects for people who are interested in uh, delving into science and data and so forth. Um, we've been doing PCR for pertussis since 1995 as a diagnostic test in the laboratory uh, where I work, and our assay actually detects both Bordetella pertussis and this other organism, Bordetella parapertussis. And uh, as you know, PCR is a very sensitive technique. Uh, you're amplifying lots of DNA. And because of that, we have a lot of quality control processes in place. And one of the quality control processes we have in place is just simply to monitor the rate of positivity of all of our assays. It's um, a way of telling us that there might be a problem with an assay. For example, if the positivity rate goes too low, maybe your assay might be underperforming, or if it goes too high, you might be having a problem with the dreaded contamination where you have amplified DNA that's causing false positive results. Now, I will say we have a lot of processes in place to prevent that, but one of the processes we have in place to monitor is to simply look at our percent positivity. So for an assay where you expect a regular percent positivity over time, um, something like maybe uh, Clostridium difficile or VRE, I mean, there can be reasons for those to change, but we don't expect things to be going up and down or to be hopefully having big outbreaks of things and so forth. If you have good infection control practices, it's fairly easy and you can look at your statistics over time and say, well, my assay typically runs at X positivity and I'm gonna set some upper and lower control limits and then I'm just gonna monitor that over time. For assays that are seasonal, like influenza, for example, mm -hmm. it's really tricky to do that because you wouldn't expect to find a large number of cases in the summertime. You know, sometimes we can. We're starting to see flu right now. But, it, uh, you know, we typically expect it to go up in the wintertime, but how high and so forth, so it's harder to set. Well, for pertussis and paraprotussis, in some ways, some of that was unknown back in 1995 when we started to monitor this. So we, we just decided to monitor it. And with paraprotussis, we typically see a percent positivity that falls below 1% of our assays. So just if you take all our assays across the board that we do, PCR for Bordetella paraprotussis, it's typically uh, less than 1%. But um, in the second part of 2014, our rates went up. And actually, my first concern was, I have a problem with my assay. And so we did a lot of troubleshooting to look into whether we had a problem with the assay. You know, we surveyed the environment to see whether we had the organism Just or its DNA in the environment in our lab. I mean, this is very concerning as a lab director when all yes. of a sudden something is going along and then it goes up, right? And we don't really understand the epidemiology. My first thought is problem with the assay. So we looked into it and we determined that there wasn't a problem with the assay. I mean, we did a lot of work on this. But what we did see is that there appeared to be a true spike in positivity in the assay. And so that was my project was let's take a look and see what's going on here. Uh, because I, I think we're seeing an outbreak of Bordetella paraprotussis, even though I'm using this data really to just simply check the quality of an assay being performed in a diagnostic lab. So that was where the idea came from. And then 
gave it back to him to uh, look into and see what he could figure out. And one of the neat things about uh, ICAC ICC is you get to actually include pictures in your abstract. And Chris, you can go to the image, and what we have that we're showing to the internet audience is the, is the uh, slide that you actually have uh, illustrating the sure. spike in uh, Bordetella peripatussis in the late period of 2014. I think it principally starts in October. I can't see it. Yeah, I can't see it. It, it starts in, in October. And so how did you monitor that and what did you think when you began to get the data? Were you one of these excited researchers when, oh my, what, what do we have? Uh, it was certainly exciting because uh, Dr. Patel had even and said that not a lot is known about Bordetella peripertussis. A lot of the focus has always been on Bordetella pertussis. So I didn't have maybe as much of a focused guideline as to what to look for when I started to examine these patients. So it was kind of exciting because I did feel a little bit like detective work going through some of the patient charts and trying to, to glean the, the, the information that was pertinent, I guess, for each case and, and try and put together a clinical picture for those patients that tested positive in the later half of 2014. So, so what are you going to share with the audience during your slide session? Uh, so we're going to talk about um, the patients that consented in 2014 that we examined their medical charts um, basically presented with typical whooping cough sy symptoms um, of this clinical syndrome pertussis um, and also that a hundred percent of our patients were vaccinated oh my for pertussis so um, that leads us to believe one that we can't really distinguish clinically between Bordetella pertussis infection and Bordetella peripertussis um, it also leads us to believe, which has already been pretty well proven, that the acellular vaccine that we use in the United States isn't necessarily protective against Bordetella peripertussis. Um, and it also leads us to believe that it might be worth testing for Bordetella pertussis as well as Bordetella peripertussis when a child comes into the clinic with typical whooping cough syndromes and a test is performed. So, so that's absolutely fascinating. And so do you think that your results would warrant a multi-center trial to, to begin to look to see at the frequency that we're picking up paraprotussis ac across the country? Um, I don't know about that. I would have to refer to Dr. Patel as the... Yeah. Well, what, what do you think? I, I mean, mean it's, it's, an, it's a very intriguing result. Is, is the juice worth the squeeze? I mean, will is peripatussis a significant um, indicator? I mean, will physicians treat it differently than, you know, you've been vaccinated with whooping cough and maybe the vaccine's just not working, so the standard of care is we'll treat you as we would for whooping, whooping cough and, yeah. you know, go from there. It's a good question. Um, despite the presentation of this data on Bordetella peripatussis, Bordetella pertussis itself is much more common than Bordetella peripatussis. What was surprising to us was that the severity of symptoms, at least in the modern era, with a fully vaccinated population, which I'm excited to report about that we have that at, at our, our place, um, was very similar for the two organisms. So if you're just looking at severity of disease, you know, they're pretty similar, but if you're looking at frequency of disease, Bordetella pertussis is going to overwhelm the number of cases compared to Bordetella peripertussis. So I, but I do think it's it's always helpful to say we should try to understand the epidemiology of a disease better. I think that's that's a reasonable question. As far as I understand, Bordetella peripertussis is not a nationally reportable disease. I could be wrong about that. But uh, for that reason, we don't have a great handle on the national or international epidemiology Trent. of this infection. As you know, um, Bordetella pertussis itself has been resurgent in recent years. And back when I was a medical student, pertussis itself was really felt to be a, a very non-significant type of infection because we were using whole cell vaccines. We didn't see a lot of this disease. Uh, so it was something we, that was mentioned in our teaching, but it really wasn't very important. Now today, it's a different story, right? For a variety of reasons, probably we see a fair amount of of Bordetella pertussis, and what we're, we're reporting is that some of that pertussis syndrome is likely Bordetella peripertussis. But how much should be done about this? 
you know, we can't really answer that question with our, our work. It's, it's, it's early days, as, they, as yeah. they say. I mean, this is, is really exciting that as a, a brand new medical student, you, you, you get your hands on data and, and began to pursue a, a clinical question. Um, did you actually interact with, with the patients when you were, uh, or you just reviewed the charts yourself? I just reviewed the charts. There's no patient interaction. Did you get to play in the lab? Um, no, no. Oh. I did not get to play. All the good stuff. All the good stuff. They just, they, they left it out. But what he did was really important for us because, you know, we had the data and um, what we really needed to put the story together was someone to look at the medical records of these patients and tell us what was going on. Um, and I know you're going to delve into it a little bit more, but there were a few other interesting findings in the data. So why don't, why don't we just jump to that? What were the other interesting findings that you had in the data? Um, so 40% of our patients uh, had post tussive vomiting, which is that coughing so hard that essentially they're, they're vomiting. 40% um, had coryza, or typical cold-like symptoms. Um, there was a lot of sleep disturbance and apnea that was associated, and there was also some sore throat that was being complained about as well. Interestingly, there was two sets of two siblings each that were in our patient population. Really? And uh, five patients had reported having exposure to pertussis at some point throughout their day. For example, in daycare, there was a pertussis exposure. Um, but uh, other than that, um, we already spoke to the fact that there was a 100% vaccination in our entire patient population. Um, and uh, so yeah. Did I think um, the other thing that stood out to me is that these patients were younger than the typical patient who's infected with Bordetella pertussis. Now remember that um, we just stated that the vaccine probably doesn't work. I mean, these, these patients were all vaccinated and mm -hmm. got this. That doesn't mean the vaccine had failed, but it's strongly suggestive of that. And um, so these patients were younger. Uh, I think the, the average age was a six. Or six. Yeah, and, that's what I was yeah. going to ask is what, how old were they uh, in your cohort that you analyzed? What was the average age? So the average age was uh, 5.9 or six years. Um, we had two patients that were under one year of age, uh, but there was no neonates in our study and it ranged all the way up to 11 years of age. When do you get vaccinated for um, pertussis? Um, so the CDC recommends vaccination, I believe, at two, four, and six months, and then anywhere from 15 to 18 months, and then after that, I believe, at six years, but I'm not oh, entirely positive. another preteen booster. Yes, yeah. and then you or get boosted. 15 to 18, yeah. So um, I, I know in, in our pediatric hospital, we're, we're recommending that adults get boosted for pertussis because it, it seems to have resurged in, in the 20-something population and has come back. And so we're, we're recommending that they get um, boosted for pertussis itself. The other important uh, group of uh, people recently for whom vaccine has been recommended is pregnant women. Because, you know, you heard about how sick this cough makes you. But I don't think any of these patients were hospitalized. They, no. they were sick but they weren't dying of this. Mm -hmm. But there is a group of patients that can die of pertussis, and, and that is your neonate, your, your really young infants, before they get the vaccine and have a chance to build up their immunity. And a very interesting strategy that, based on recent evidence, seems to be working is to vaccinate the mom, and then she transfers antibody to the baby, and the baby's protected. And that is the group that traditionally will really suffer from severe consequences. So we were happy we didn't have any, any um, uh, subjects who were really, really young in this study. Yeah, that, that, that was what I thought was part of the exciting news when I looked at the data set and the, and the, that was available in the abstract is that there were no neonates in, in your cohort. So that also is uh, uh, an interesting finding that it's probable because of the, the good medical care they receive in your area of the country that they're encouraging pregnant women to indeed get boosted. So you're listening to ASM Live here at ICC ICAC, and if anybody has a question in the audience, please feel free to go to the microphone and ask Dr. Patel and uh, Dr. Corrales a, a question. Uh, yeah, Michael Smith, MedPage today. The first question is numbers. How many, uh, how many patients were involved here? 
So in our 2014 outbreak, we had 31 patients in total in the year 2014. Um, 25 of those patients presented in the months of October through December, which showed us that big spike that we saw on the graph towards the end of 2014. Okay, um, the, and the other question is, is, was there any sort of epidemiological pattern? Were these uh, all in the same daycare, or did they know each other, or did, um, you, did you find any kind of links, links among them? No, um, we did look towards their location. Um, they're throughout southeastern Minnesota. Um, but as I had mentioned, five patients had reported being exposed to pertussis um, as reported by their parents in some form throughout their daily life. Um, and then there was also two sets of s two siblings each that were also infected essentially together um, with Bordetella paraprotussis. So I, I, I'm going to jump in with a comment. Um, our lab actually does testing for Bordetella pertussis and Bordetella paraprotussis for the whole country, actually for the whole world. We're a reference lab. And the trend of increased positivity that was noted was across all the tests that we were doing. Um, so it appeared that there was an outbreak going on that was much more widespread than in our local population. The population of Rochester, Minnesota is probably about 109,000. It's kind of a small town, if you will. And the reason why I wanted to look at this local population is that it's really the only population where we can get information on what's going on with the patients. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were seeing at the same time this what appeared to be a larger, more national outbreak of Bordetella paraprotesis, and we're still digging into some of that data. Okay, that actually leads into my, that, that's fascinating because uh, uh, that sort of makes this more than just a, a local phenomenon. That, th my final question, uh, not the final one probably, but I'll have others later. Um, <laughs> the question that, I, that, I, that I, I wanted to ask was, there have been in recent years some fairly large outbreaks of pertussis. And I'm not clear on how those are diagnosed. They can be diagnosed clinically with the characteristic cough, but they could also be diagnosed uh, using PCR methods. Is it possible that some of those outbreaks, uh, which involved many, in many cases, people who had been vaccinated, uh, were not in fact pertussis, but paraprotussis? Uh, and therefore, the, the, this whole concern about the vaccine not working might in fact be a function of, of this, this, other, this other organism. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> I think the answer to your questions are yes and yes. So I'll, I'll give you my perspective on that. We had an outbreak of Bordetella pertussis back in 2012, and we actually published that data in the Mayo Clinic proceedings last year. Um, during that outbreak, so there was a big upsurge in the number of cases of Bordetella pertussis, and there was nationally, there were a lot of outbreaks going on at that time. We noted an uptick in cases of Bordetella paraprotussis mixed in with that outbreak and also of interest the strains of Bordetella pertussis because we did some cultures in association with that outbreak um, didn't appear to be clonal so that was for me that didn't make a lot of sense in terms of an outbreak but that was what was going on so to, to answer your question um, if you're dealing with an outbreak of pertussis you really do need to look at how people are establishing that diagnosis. Is it based on clinical symptoms alone? Is it based on culture? Is it based on the use of PCR? And, and then you can really understand what the organism is. So if you're just using clinical symptoms, the data that we're presenting suggests that it could be paraprotussis or it could be a mixture of pertussis and paraprotussis that's going on at the same time, even though, again, that seems non-intuitive, that's what we were seeing in our outbreaks. Um, but we have good tools to make these diagnoses today. So hopefully in outbreaks, people will use tools, either culture or PCR, to establish what the organism actually is so we can understand what's going on. Okay, thank you. Looks like we have a question from the net. Yes, uh, this question is from Mohammed. He asked on Facebook, um, people who had already had exposure to Bordetella pertussis um, either f through the vaccination or through having the disease, did they experience any type of um, advantage over people who had not had um, the exposure uh, when, when getting um, an outbreak, this outbreak? So our study doesn't necessarily answer that question, but um, in general, in the literature, uh, exposure to pertussis isn't necessarily protective against Bordetella paraprotussis. Um, 
partly, even though they're closely related in lineage, antigenically and immunologically, they're rather different species. So uh, the acellular, acellular vaccinine will not protect against Bordetella peripertussis based on a lot of the studies that are currently out there. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, this brings this session of ASM Live to a close, and I'd like to thank my guests, Dr. Robin Patel and Vitas Corrales, for joining us here this morning. Uh, please join us for our next episode at 1045. This and all the ASM Live sessions are archived uh, for you to review at the ASM Live archive section at Microworld. And until next time, take an opportunity to follow us on TWIM, TWIV, or TWIP, or our newest podcast, Microbe Magazine, which is available to download either from iTunes or microbeworld.org. Until next time, I'm Michael Schmidt from TWIM. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>